Hi guys, it is a stormy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization, which may or may not be the last day of spring uh, 2020. And my name is Sam Mitchell, and you have found your way to Collapse Chronicles. But this week, as you're probably aware by now, we are in the middle of a special series the Coronavirus Chronicles, where what I am doing is I am interviewing more than 20 of the folks I have had on Collapse Chronicles in the past about uh, their view of the coronavirus and what it means for global industrial civilization. And guys, it is a great honor to bring back the man, did he close out 2019? Anyway, the editor of the News Junkie Post and the author of the Orwellian Empire, we're going to head over to Coronavirus Stan and we're going to bring on the show, I hope I get this right, Gilbert Melfier. So Gilbert, come on and say hello to the folks and we're going to dive right into this conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Sam, and, and hello to everybody on, on Collapse Chronicles. Okay, so we're going to dive right into this. I'm somewhat surprised that you actually wanted to go through, that, that you wanted to follow the format. Uh, I, I offered to give this man free reign, but he said no. He, wants, he thought this was a good list of questions. So we're going to start with our overarching essay question. Do you believe that coronavirus could be the trigger for the collapse of global industrial civilization, and why or why not? Take it away. I, I am not sure that uh, COVID-19 can be actually called a trigger, Sam. Uh, I think it is more uh, like a catalyst, a both in, in global sociological and historical sense, which is in process of having initiated an incredible chain reaction. I'll explain. It, it, you know, it's like a, a microscopic virus has become, paradoxically, the vector of some sort of paradigm shift, okay, which could be time will tell a unique moment in humanity history. It has exposed the colossal failure of global capitalism, as well as the absolute incompetence of the so-called political and business leaders. The modest creature side effect is to also crush the global financial market like a giant wrecking ball. For 99% of people, this comes as a shock. But for you and I, Sam, and, and the, the follower of Collapse Chronicles, uh, uh, we all knew it. We knew the systemic collapse is coming and unfolding. The coronavirus was the missing ingredient, if you wish, to bring a sick civilization to its knees. The other ingredient, the macro one, to the systemic collapse are, of course, climate change, overpopulation in my mind, and social inequality. To be, to be a bit ironic, because, you know, we have to keep a little bit of a sense of humor, uh, it, it is at the same time uh, the coronavirus, the catalyst, and the missing link between the three macro issues humanity was already facing. Uh, we are now in uncharted territory. Okay, we certainly are. So, where would you place the, uh, looking at the direct threat of coronavirus to global industrial civilization, where would you place it? Is it, is it at the top of the list, at the very bottom of the list, nowhere on the list, or right in the middle with everything else that's uh, gnawing away at the edges of civilization at the moment? <clears throat> well, Sam, it, it's quite high. Uh, uh, as of March 19, both confirmed cases of uh, COVID-19 and death from it 
were climbing exponentially. The, the graphs are rather scary, you know, worldwide, and of course the, the numbers are, are moving at an incredible speed every day. We were at almost uh, uh, 200, 250,000 cases and 10,000 deaths. Okay, but you see, the thing is, there's a lot of dramatization here. Uh, however deadly and contagious COVID-19 is, things have to be put in, in the perspective of, of the other pandemics uh, uh, that uh, humanity uh, has faced in, a, in, in the history of, of mankind, such as the Black Plague, which killed 40% of Europe population during the Middle Age, or the 1918-1920 Spanish flu, which killed 50 million. We are far from that yet. But again, Sam, to specifically answer your question, the big threats, the macro ones, are still climate change, inequality, and overpopulation. I'm going back to it. Why COVID-19 is the catalyst to make the collapse chain reaction gel, it is kind of, if you wish, uh, the cherry on the top of the, 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 the collapse banana split. <laughs> Coronavirus is the cherry on the top of the collapse Ooh. banana split. <laughs> Obviously, we have the title to this video. Uh, <laughs> there you go. So, so, well, do you consider that this, you know, the direct threat that you're that you're talking about to to human health do you consider that or do you consider the the unfolding knock-on effects to the global industrial economy which one of these will ultimately be remembered as the uh, the biggest threat uh, posed by coronavirus to civilization well, it's kind of a domino effect, if you wish, uh, Tom. In terms of systemic collapse, the bigger threat, which is crushing all stock market, and cynically, I am sure, is the, the biggest concern uh, uh, for politicians and, and, uh, and the rich uh, than losses of life, okay? Uh, it, it's, it's on its way to, to collapse, the, the, uh, the, the global economy is, is pretty much uh, at, in halt. Everywhere in the world, central banks are literally throwing money at the problem, and it has not really any effect. You know, financial markets, just like individuals, are terrified, Sam. There's a, there's a panic. Uh, uh, to give you an example, Sam, the Fed in the U.S., has already injected $1.2 trillion yeah. to patch the hole, okay, to no effect. The European Central Bank is doing the same. Everybody is printing money. That's what they're doing. Uh, they are terrified to have a run on the bank. Uh, uh, just like, you know, there is a run on toilet paper for consumers. You know, the, the global COVID-19, and I'm calling it a global COVID-19 depression, not recession, okay, is coming. And it will be likely worse, in my opinion at least, than the Great Depression of 1929. So you actually see the, the smash to the economy bigger than the Great Depression. I mean, it's, you're, not, you're, you're certainly not ruling that out. And you're saying it 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 could happen. Uh, wow. So, uh, well, what do you? So, let, let's talk about the reaction to this. You you've spoken of the, the obviously the the banksters' reaction to this, which is certainly in bed with the uh, with the government's reaction. Just. Here in here in the U.S. specifically, uh, although this model is, is is taking shape, but you know day by day with every country now, do you think the the reaction by the government is? Do you think it's overblown? Have they overstepped their bounds? Uh, or is it not strict enough? Do they need to ramp up? 
uh, what they're doing, or do you think it's just about just about the right and about all they can do that they're doing everything they can correctly? How do you? How are you reading it? Look, basically, some all the reactions of of m m most governments and instances like the WHO were wrong, mainly by the timing of them or the lack of transparency. Except, I would have to say, and that has to be mentioned, China, South Korea, and Germany, okay? All political leaders otherwise failed. They all failed their citizens. In China, where the disease appeared, in, in uh, December 2019, and here I want to dispel something, no, the coronavirus is not a hoax. No, the coronavirus was not planted by the CIA in China or Israel. All this is a conspiracy theory nonsense. They were almost, the Chinese, immediately proactive and transparent by letting the international uh, science community know about the virus. Further, they handled the problem with determination and drastic measures, okay? The, the WHO failed by not declaring it a pandemic early enough. At the exception of China, South Korea, and Germany, countries fail by not testing enough as well either because they couldn't do the testing because they wanted to hide the numbers of cases. Basically, the pandemic exposed government failures everywhere. I will give you an example here of a country that, that I know very well because it's mine. In France, which is currently under lockdown, under basically martial law uh, uh, and citizen confinement, the health minister, Agnès Buzyn, gave a warning of a quote-unquote coronavirus tsunami both to President Macron and his prime minister, Edouard Philippe, in mid-January. She was not heard. You know, it's all a question of timing, Sam. Now, those politicians and Trump in the U.S., they're saying that it's a war that they're fighting. Uh, uh, nous sommes en guerre, uh, uh, said the, you know, Macron. Well, when you go to work, number one, you need good generals. We don't have good generals. Number two, you need weapons. The weapons here are lacking. You need masks, uh, uh, mass amount. You, you need pulmonary ventilator. You need to do tests and so on. And you need hospital bed. It, it's, again, it's all a question of timing, Sam, timing, and full transparency, and also international cooperation, not panic and shutting down borders. Well, panic is panic is what we've got. Panic is is definitely what we got, which we're going to get to uh, after we. Uh, okay, so uh, Joe Bell, are you? Are you one of the one of the few people out of the twenty two I'm um, interviewing who wants to dive into what what clearly, judging by the reaction to this series, is the most contra out of out of this entire discussion the most controversial one? Do you see it, it, in any any problem, or, or do you believe that the threat? of coronavirus, I guess both towards our health and our economy, trumps, to use a word, our civil rights. Should our government be given the power to curtail such basic, basic freedoms as the freedom of assembly, the freedom of movement, uh, or do you think that individuals, that this should be left to the individual to decide for himself or herself how best to respond to this level of threat? Okay, Sam, I'm going to go completely against the grain. I've already done it in writing on News <laughs> Junkie Post. I'm saying absolutely not, Sam. What's going on right now worldwide, and it's almost worldwide, and it will be worldwide, take my word for it, 
and I've already mentioned it, by the, the term of world president and all, the, all, that, all that stuff going on. It's more than alarming. You know, the authoritarian patterns which government are applying one after the other is just incredible. You know, uh, uh, Italy, Spain, and France are supposed to be democracies, okay? But at the moment, more than 200 million Europeans are living under de facto martial law, uh, having lost all basic freedom, all basic liberties, such as freedom of movement and assembly. They have to live confined to their home. Virtual prisoners with police and military patrolling the streets. There's 100,000 uh, uh, police and gendarmes deployed in France, giving people fine if they do not behave a certain way. You know, fear and paranoia has set in worldwide. They have been deprived of all civil rights. They can only go out to buy. It's very specific to buy food, medicine, and go to work. Uh, if they cannot work remotely, no, they are recommended to work remotely. It's, it's, it's a surreal uh, uh, Orwellian contract, if you wish. Uh, 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 Europeans are living in a, in a dystopian nightmare pretty much overnight. And do you see an end to it? That's uh, what Keith Hayes, I was just uh talking to, you know, he said there is no exit strategy. Where, where is this going to end? How long, I mean, is this some temporary uh, semi, at least, martial law, or, or, or is this the new normal that we can expect as more and more well, of these events unfold in the 20th century? Can we expect a more uh, militarized uh, fascist response to uh, to to quote threats against the civilization. I... Uh, uh, people people will revolt. Okay, people will not take it. Okay, uh, you look this thing again. It's not a hoax. Okay, it's real. There's a real threat here, but it was completely blotched, and they're taking advantage. Governments that are corrupt, incompetent, they're taking advantage to put the squeeze on, on, on civil liberties. The, the, more, the most essential one, okay? In France and in Italy, in Italy it was supposed to, to end uh, April 3rd. It's going to be extended for another two weeks at least, you know? Yeah. So that's what I think. Well, I, it, it's, uh, again, I, I don't like to use this platform to debate my guests, this is but this is a, I, I I like friendly debates with you, brother. Uh, I, I just spoke with Joao Abigail this morning from Portugal. I don't know if you're familiar with that young man. And what he was talking about, what he has seen in Portugal, is not just an acceptance of this government response by locking down the country. He, he described it as the public clamoring, clamoring for an iron-fisted government. Uh, not the, the absolute uh, opposite of, of, of revolution against this. It's that in times yes. of panic that, that people will, are, are, are looking for an authority figure. What, what do you say about that? About what he had to say about what's going on in Portugal. And I'm seeing a little bit of it with my own personal friends here in Austin. Look, I, I, I think he's wrong. I hope he's wrong. People eventually will react. Uh, uh, right now, they, they're shell-shocked. They're like, they're like gears in a headlight, okay? They're scared. They should not be scared. The fear is a factor here, which is really bad, you know, the, the old stuff, the panic buying and the, the compulsive hoarding, uh, uh, it, it's spreading a, 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 as fast, even in the U.S. where you can still have liberty of movement, as fast as the coronavirus. It, it's, it's bordering on collective psychosis. Nowadays, you go to a market, some in the U.S. or in Europe, 
And you see empty shelves. Now, that's a problem. Uh, what is surprising, as people seem to, uh, to gather enough food to last for months, is, of course, and it's comical because one has to laugh, is the one on toilet paper. And, and it is, at the same time, uh, uh, comical and pathetic and symptomatic. You know, perhaps deep inside, the toilet paper orders know that they are a-holes. But <laughs> joke aside, Sam, what government should worry about is jobless people, okay? 20 million in the U.S. as projected by uh, the, the Trump administration. Burden with debt, okay? Running out of money. Also, uh, the, the spread of food shortage, uh, the supply line getting, getting interrupted. That is a problem. Uh, most of us can already witness it in supermarkets, and I'm talking about real food items like rice and beans. And that could translate very, very quickly, Sam, in major social unrest, major one. Uh, I'm talking especially in countries like France with an history of revolution. Okay, so this is obviously the time for me to ask this question. As I have been saying, when this was still just over in China, from day one I have been saying what we're going to see with this coronavirus, and it, and it exactly what I was talking about it is unfolding, is we are going to see uh, a snap, what I call a snapshot into the future of collapse. If, if this panic freak out, this worldwide freak out panic over, uh, over the coronavirus has instilled this mass hysteria over, over this planet's population, do you see this only intensifying as more and more of these coronavirus events start to crop up as things no. as the fly apart begins. No, uh, Sam, I think I'm actually optimistic. You see, again, I always go against the brain. I'm a, I'm a very, very stubborn <laughs> uh, uh, French person. I do not suffer for, for uh, better or worse. I, I am not afraid of anything, never has been, and I have no anxiety. So I think it's a unique opportunity. The, the coronavirus crisis is a unique opportunity. If you wish, it's a wake-up call for humanity. A moment of truth, okay, which must bring up a complete reassessment, and I insist, complete reassessment of the way we live, not only together, but in our relationship with nature, you know, again, I truly think, Sam, that COVID-19 is the complete unexpected trigger of a, of a global sociological paradigm shift. Everything must be on the table, Sam. It's tabula rasa. We put everything on the table. Uh, and, you know, it, it, I, I think it's actually, I think, I think uh, COVID-19, and it's probably going to irritate a lot of people, is actually a good thing. As long as we deal with the macro elements of the systemic crisis, which I repeat, global warming, social inequality, and other population, you know. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, I'm actually surprised by, by your optimism on this now. This has been... This has cropped up in most of the conversations I've had about th this wake-up call to a critical mass. So you actually believe, I, I, so, so you are in the camp that this, you use the word is, not could be. You use the word is going to be a, a, a wake-up call in the trigger to turn no, this around. No, no, it, it it, it is a wake-up call. What I'm doing is a projection. There's a, there's a projection where actually government will change willingly, and there's another project, projection which they will not. And, and so they, there's a couple of projections that can be made. But, you know, of course, um, uh, COVID-19 is linked 
to the way humanity has messed up. We, we have all messed up. Uh, uh, we have messed up our, our connection with the natural world since the, the Industrial Revolution. And it's all interconnected, Sam. You know, I mean, this pandemic, the climate crisis, it, it's all connected to, to this sort of like Faustian vision of the world where human behave like the masters of nature. We are not the master of nature. Uh, not just, we are just a portion of it, okay? A portion of it. The coronavirus is a lesson in humility for mankind. It gives our species the opportunity again to reinvent ourselves. Uh, and if we do tabula uh, rasa uh, uh, of, of the, the current system, uh, which is global, perhaps we can dodge and then put you out of business, hopefully, the, the looming collapse. Okay, and with that, uh, we are we are running up on thirty minutes. Uh, so I'm I'm actually pleasantly surprised, uh, Gilbert Melthier, that you ended up on an optimistic note. And I guess time will tell uh, over the next couple of decades uh, wh whether your your optimism pays off or not. And let's all hope that it does. But right now, guys. As much as it pains me to say this, I have got to wrap up another edition of the Coronavirus Chronicles. If you enjoyed what Gilbert had to share with us, please thumb it up. If you did not enjoy it, thumb it down. And by all means, come over here and subscribe to Collapse Chronicles for more doom and gloom. And there is a lot more where this came from. And Gilbert Melfier, one more time, thank you for coming on to the show again. And more importantly, keep up the good work, brother. Thank you for having me, uh, Sam, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, my uh, uh, stay optimistic, you, you guys up there. Don't, don't, don't uh, give in to the, 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 the politics of like fear and paranoia. Don't, don't, uh, don't give in to that. Stay optimistic. All right, and with that, we will say bye, guys.